Hi, I'm Karling Tangen from the Norwegian School of Leadership and Theology, and I will present a lecture on leadership and the first commandment. Leadership and the first commandment, the purpose and perspective of this study. The first commandment is announced in Exodus 20. And God spoke all these words, I am the Lord your God who brought you out of Egypt, out of the land of slavery. You shall have no other gods before me. What does this commandment mean in the context of contemporary organizational leadership? That is a problem that I set out to explore. The God presented in this text is the God who reveals himself as the Redeemer of Israel. For this reason, I will begin my quest from a distinctive Judeo-Christian horizon. However, in the process I will also suggest that this tradition shares some common ground with other moral traditions. To be a human being or to worship. It is crucial to notice that the ten words are given within the context of a larger narrative that present God as the creator of heaven and earth. Genesis 1.26 describes the creation of man as follows. Then God said, Let us make mankind in our image, in our likeness, so that they may rule over the fish in the sea and the birds in the sky, over the livestock and all the wild animals, and over all the creatures that move along the ground. According to Augustine, man was created to be a loving creature, called to enjoy God's love and to worship him and love him back with the same kind of self-giving love or caritas. Man should also love his fellow man and was given a divine mandate to create culture. Unfortunately, the fall of Adam led man into a form of self-centered love or cupiditas that turned his worship and desire towards that which is created. As we enter the story, God has initiated a new beginning. In Exodus, Israel is delivered from slavery and designated as a nation of holy priests chosen to worship God and to fulfill his purposes in the world. Rather than living under a despotic monarch in Egypt, who was considered man, ruler and God, Israel was now given freedom, not from belonging to God, but in the sense of living under a law to which its leaders also were accountable. The ten words are therefore covenantal obligations to God, but at the same time a gift, a call to become a blessing and light to the nations, and perhaps also a paradigm for organizations. For this reason, Israel is given the task of building a dwelling place for God, where they may worship through rituals of praise. However, the covenant also requests that right worship must manifest in a moral and just community. This also includes showing hospitality to the resident alien who is located in the same situation as the Israelites were in Egypt. Thus, true worship is both explicit worship in the tabernacle and ethical worship in all domains of life. Jesus sums up the law in two commandments, to love God wholeheartedly and to love one's neighbor as oneself. To have another God before me, idolatry. The obvious negation of true worship is worship of idols. In Israel's context, there were different gods for different needs. Some ancient kings also saw themselves as a god. Thus, in the Old Testament, idolatry may apply to both images and people that Israel went astray to worship. Throughout the prophetic literature, this is seen as a violation of the covenant with Yahweh, Israel's husband and Lord. The key questions in these prophetic confrontations were who will you serve and in whose power will you trust? An idol is therefore whatever that claims the ultimate devotion, loyalty and trust that belongs to God alone. Sociologi sociologists Tony Campolo and David Fraser suggest that idolatry also can be known by its fruits. From evidence in the book of Amos and Hosea, they conclude that idolatry always leads to social injustice. In other words, those who go to Bethel to perform flawed worship are the same people who trample the head of, poor, of the poor into the dust of the earth. Amos 2, 6 and 7. In the long term, this leads to disaster, not only for the poor, but also for the oppressors who are destroyed by God's judgment.
judgment. The connection between false worship, immoral relations and judgments is also evident in the New Testament. The original sin, according to Paul, is to place any created thing in the position or status that, is, that the Creator is meant to occupy. The judgment is that men are left to their own desires and become slaves and their idols like greed of other unquenchable cravings, so that they miss God's purposes and fall short of the glory of God. Summing up the biblical story of the first commandment, I would suggest that these insights from the biblical story may be summed up as follows. 1. True worship recognizes God as the ultimate power. 2. It is grounded in God's salvation and purposes. 3. It takes place as a priestly service of praise. and 4. Manifests in the formation of a moral community. 5. It can be summed up as wholeheartedly love for God and one's neighbor. 6. Idolatry can be summed up in giving the trust, devotion and loyalty that belong to God to someone or something else. 7. This leads to social injustice, a distortion of human desire and finally ends with disaster. Mention of leadership and the need for theological discernment. How does this relate to leadership in late modern organizations? Organizational leadership is often defined as a social influence process whereby an individual influences a group to achieve common goals. Euclid and Leipzinger suggest that such leadership has three meta dimensions. Leadership is one, task oriented, two, it is also relations oriented, and finally, three, it is strategic and change oriented. How does these dimensions relate to the first commandment? I would suggest that the first commandment implies a fourth dimension of leadership, that of spirituality. In the field of organizational leadership, spirituality has been defined in several ways related to man's search for meaning, the formation of moral virtues, and the capability to connect with the transcendent. The first commandment defines the biblical God as the proper integrating center of all these capabilities as well as the proper integrating center of the three dimensions of leadership. It also challenges alternative centers that calls for our ultimate trust, devotion and loyalty. Thus, the spiritual or theological dimension of leadership concerns how a given organization defines and relates to the sacred or alternative ultimate concerns. I'm not suggesting that all organizations can relate to the sacred in exactly the same way, but I am proposing that spiritual discernment is a part of organizational leadership. The reason is, as social anthropologist Tian Sir have suggests, that all organizations depend on trust and power. These phenomena are religious in the Weberian sense of belonging to some form of Hinterwelt. They are invisible, not fully controllable, and call for some form of transcendent purpose of uh, or ultimate reference. The biblical concepts of worship and idolatry as tools for organizational analysis. In the following, I will try to show how the biblical story may be used as a tool for discernment of implicit spirituality in organizations. Following James K. Smith, I will suggest that human persons are not thinking things, but rather worshiping creatures who are defined by love and shaped by practices that aim our hearts to certain ends. The most important practices, according to Smith, are rituals that both reflect and shapes what matters to us. Liturgies are 1. Formative for identity, 2. They inculcate particular visions of the good life, and 3 do this so powerfully that they are able to trump other ritual formations in terms of shaping habitual orientations toward ultimate concerns. It may follow that the world of late modern organizations is not religiously neutral, but full of liturgies that may capture our heart and our imagination. I will nevertheless make a distinction between thin, quasi-religious rituals that may have certain similarities with religious rituals, and thick pseudo-religious liturgies that mediates a whole sensibility and pattern of life that is based on finite values. 
This is according to the definition of ideology given by Keller and Margaret and Habertal. Following Margaret Archer, I will also maintain that people can respond differently to such rituals since they are conditioned but not determined by the social context. A key insight in Timothy Keller's analysis of ideology is that good things may become idols by taking on a disproportionate size and power within a society. This applies to organizational leadership as well. All the dimensions of organizational leadership are valid aspects of the cultural mandate that was given to man in creation. These may nevertheless become idols if they are given the trust, devotion and loyalty that belongs to God alone. This will happen if organizational leaders lose sight of the transcendent moral context. In light of the first commandment, this means, one, that they are accountable to God, but also, two, to the higher ethical and social goods that are described in the last six of the ten words, and that may have certain a certain family resemblance or common ground with other major moral traditions. Brand management and visionary leadership.